questions. Uh, but we concluded that if generosity is an attitude. It's coming to a place in your life when giving is more important than getting. Giving is more important than getting. Sharing is more important than storage. And we talked about uh, mainly uh, about money last week. And uh, so you probably walked out of here thinking, well, all he's doing is plugging us for money. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't care what you give. I mean, that's up to you and him. Uh, but the point is this, and, and this is where it's going to get, I think, really productive in three or four weeks. Giving is financially is the bottom bar of generosity. Uh, I said last week, if, if you can't get your financial giving on straight, the things that really matter in life, where you need to be generous, uh, you'll never come close, cl close to reaching that bar. Uh, so when we're talking about finances and we're talking about generosity, uh, yes, uh, giving is important. But uh, if you feel like that's the issue, then you're missing the issue. Okay? Okay. Uh, last week we read from uh, Psalm 37. Uh, I gave you some numbers last week. I'm going to just hit a few numbers this morning and uh, move on from there. Remember that more than 85% of Americans give less than what of their income to charity? 2%. 2%. And we told you the average income in America is $57,000. That amounts to that person giving $27.40 a week. That's what 85% of Americans give in uh, charitable giving. Interesting fact here. And that, that amounts to, what was the number? $390 billion. It sounds like a lot of money, right? Wow, wow, wow. Okay. In 2018, Americans spent, fill in the blank, on Christmas. <laughs> 50 times that number. I don't know what the math is, but a trillion dollars. Get your head around that. A trillion dollars is 100 million times 100 million. That's, and that's what Americans spent on Christmas. That's 500 times more. Yeah. Oh, and we, we think we're generous because we give $390 billion in a year to charity. Hmm. A lot of people say this. Well, you don't understand, Mike. If I had more money, I would give more money. Now, nah, the data doesn't prove that either. If I had more money, I'd give more money. The wealthiest Americans, the top 1%, okay, anybody in here in that? Okay. The wealthiest Americans, the top 1%, give less than half of 1% of their total wealth in charitable gifts. So, so don't sell yourself short about giving and say, well, if I was wealthy, like so-and-so is, I would be much more generous. Eh, not so. Actually, those in the bottom 20% of income, okay, $57,000 less, I lost my place, they gave 3.2% of their income. So the poorest among us give two and a half times more than the wealthiest among us. Okay. Hmm. Slide 16, George. I'm, I'm giving George a nightmare back there. One of the greatest illnesses in America today is something, uh, it's a made up word, I think, it's called affluenza. That's a, a, a combination of affluent and fluenza. For many people, ends up resulting in a life of, get this, this is important, okay? 
It ends up in a life of chronic dissatisfaction. If you're not generous in every area in your life, you're going to be walking around chronically dissatisfied. Anybody? You don't have to raise your hand. Anybody feel that way? Say. Plus, you're going to be in debt. You're going to be overworked. You're going to be stressed. And you're going to impair your health and your relationships. Now, I know a whole lot of people, maybe none of you guys, I hope not, that that description fits them to a T. They're, they're, I know my, my view is skewed, as I've said before. People who are feeling great about life and peace and contentment usually don't knock on my door, Dan. Okay. But, but I don't think that I'm so far afield that I don't understand that a big, big majority of our society today, this would fit their description very aptly. They're dissatisfied with their life. They're in debt head over heels. They're overworked. Why, why are they overworked? Well, I'm trying to pay off all the debt I have. Well, why do you have all the debt? Because I had to get all this stuff because I felt sure if I had this stuff, I would be satisfied in life. So I'm going to, you know, Joe, what's his name? Has this great big camper and they go away every weekend. That's got to be satisfying. I'll go get me one. Okay. Beep. Dissatisfied, in debt, overworked to pay the debt, stressed because I can't work enough to pay the debt. And everybody in my family is saying, hey, can we get more? Can we do this? Can we do that? Because we've trained them at a very early age that satisfaction and peace and contentment comes from things. If you just have enough things, you'll be satisfied. So they're stressed. They have impaired health. Well, how come they have impaired health? Well, because they can't sleep enough. They can't eat, they can't eat right. They don't get enough rest. They don't take care of, how come? Well, because I'm stressed, well, how come? Because I'm in debt, well, how come? Because I'm uh, trying to buy satisfaction. None of that works. And, and here's a big one, here's where it usually ends up at my door. And they have impaired relationships. Uh, I, got, I, got a, uh, I got a text from a lady this week. Uh, if we had a lot of time, I'd read it to you. She and her husband come to see me, Marty, for seven or eight years. You say, well, Mike, you must not be doodly squat good if it takes that long. <laughs> that or they don't listen. Yeah, to let me word. trust you. Say that again. I said that or they don't listen. Yeah, they've never listened to a word I've said. And they come in and, and they're miserable. And I say, hey, you remember what we talked about last time? Did you do that? Well, you just don't understand, Mike. <laughs> okay. So this lady, uh, she's so frustrated with, his, with her husband that uh, I hope she didn't have a gun around any place. But uh, she came in to see me uh, two weeks, a couple weeks before school started. And uh, she came by herself, and uh, she, just, she was feeling really good. Uh, they'd been to... Uh, Mexico on a vacation, which they charged, they couldn't afford it. Okay. Uh, her and her husband had gone down to the, to the New River Gorge for a couple of days to celebrate their anniversary. I mean, that was a blast. Okay. And, and I said, and she said, uh, both, both the parents work in the school system. And uh, so I said, hey, you, you ready for school? Yeah. You feeling pretty? Yeah. I said, have you guys fixed this yet in your relationship? No, not really. Have you fixed this in, in your relationship with your kids? Nah, nah that, that, that's not very good either. And, and, and went through a, you know, five or six things that are just the same as they were six or seven years ago, only worse. Okay? They're more dissatisfied. They're more in debt. They're more overworked. They're more stressed. And their relationship with each other and their relationship with their kids is more impaired. Okay. They have a, 
a, a young daughter who's in her senior year of high school, and uh, uh, her, her and her dad hate each other. Hate each other. So I said, hey, so-and-so. I said, you know, it's going to be about two or three weeks into the school year, and you're going to be as frustrated as you've ever been unless you guys don't do something differently. I know that. Got a text Thursday, Friday. Hey, Mike, you were right. She, she's, she's fit to be tied. Now, what's that got to do with generosity? If we don't learn to develop an attitude of giving, of sharing, and they, they don't have that attitude. They're, they're too busy trying to pay for what they can't afford. But if you don't have a, an attitude of generosity, that can happen to your picture in life. Okay. Mike, yes. uh, Burkett said in that 12 week study that I took a lot of people through that giving is not God's way of raising money. Giving is God's way of raising you into the likeness of Christ. That's right. Say that again a little louder. Giving is not God's way of raising money. Giving is God's way of raising you into the likeness of Christ. That's right. That's you, what he said. You got that? And he's mm -hmm. on target. Yeah. Hey, let me let me give you a clue. God doesn't need your money. Right. He doesn't need your money. Oh, well, good. I'll just quit giving. It's all his anyway. Yeah, it's already his. And go ahead and quit, quit being generous. He'll take and it. get stressed and get overworked and get over da 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 da. Being generous is all about saying to God, and particularly in the other areas we're going to talk about, it's all about saying to God, I am so grateful to you that, that I can't, I just can't give you enough. There's a story, and maybe we'll look at it later. Uh, I don't have it marked in today. But at, at one point, uh, I think it was maybe before the Jews were leaving, the Hebrews were leaving Egypt. It might have been another time. But uh, they, they decided to take up a collection to take care of themselves and to take care of what they needed. Okay. And they, you, you know this story, Marty. They gave, they gave, they gave, they gave, they gave. And finally... The leadership said what? Stop. Stop! Don't give any more. We've got everything we need and more besides. They understood the concept of generosity. When Paul was talking to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, a uh, really important passage of scripture, go back and read it. It's the last part of the chapter. Uh, but let's just go over there, okay? Real quick. Ah, we're not in any hurry, are we? Doesn't matter if we get finished in 10 weeks or two. He says to the shepherds, starting in verse 28, keep watch over yourselves and all the, over all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseas. That very important scripture. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves commit among you and not spare the flock. Even from your own number, there will be men arise and distort the truth. Among the shepherds, there's going to be men arise out of that group that will distort the truth in order to draw many disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, the blood that he bought us with. I commit you to, your, to his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sacrificed. I have coveted no one's silver, gold, or clothing. How did Paul take care of himself for the three years he lived in Ephesus? He was a tent maker. Yeah, he made tents. Yeah. Made tents. I, 
I can guarantee you, I was talking to somebody about this this week, I guarantee you he was the most successful tent maker around. Most successful tent maker around. He, he didn't have to send out flyers or send out stuff over the internet to try to round up customers. He had God blessing him because he gave himself, and that's where we're going to go eventually here. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. Okay. Well, we took care of ourselves making tents. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, there's a sermon, uh, we must help the weak. What was the purpose of, of their lives? Helping other people. Remembering the words that the Lord Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than receive. That's the point Mark is making. That's you know, we try to we try to garner wealth. Garner wealth. Turn over to Luke chapter twelve. You with me? I'm with you. All right. Someone in the crowd said to him, that's Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Have you ever seen anybody's family have a fight at inheritance time? The worst fight you'll ever see. Yeah, yeah worst fight you'll ever see. So, you know, th this guy's the master, okay? And evidently, this brother wasn't splitting up the inheritance. I'm, I'm, I'm going to nail him for that, buddy. I'm going, to get, I'm going to get the master teacher to tell him that he's wrong. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me to be a judge or an arbitrator between you? Jesus is very smart. Very smart. He said, This isn't for me to decide between you and your brother. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Wow. We live in a society that's polluted with affluenza. And their life pertains to their possessions. Their life pertains to their possessions. Don't let that happen to you. Don't get caught up in your stuff and forget to be generous. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, well, what shall I do? I mean, the, my, my farm is just splurging. I don't have any place to share my crop, to store my crops. Evidently, Rhino wasn't in his area. Okay. You have to catch that from last week, okay? I don't have any place to store it. Why don't you give it away? Then he said, well, I'm not going to give it away. This is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build some bigger ones. I'll just get more storage space. I'll just go down to Rhino and buy bigger, bigger parcels. Instead of a 10 by 20, I'll buy a 30 by 40. Rent it. And I will store all of my grain, all of my grain. Where's your generosity there? And all my goods. And I'll say to myself, you've plenty of good things laid up for many years. Here's what, it, here's what people's objective is in our society. I want to store up and store up and store up and store up. So when I get to good years, when I get later in life, I can take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Boy, that's the, that's the mentality of, of a lot of people in our society. I, uh, I don't know how much of this story to tell. 
Glenda and I were talking yesterday, and uh, Seth was with us, and Lex was with us. We were driving back from Dayton. Boy, watching two soccer games in that heat yesterday was whew, toasty. So we were driving back. We dropped uh, Annie, or not Annie, she's still in Dayton. Seth and Lex off. And uh, we'd been talking about building houses in the last part of our trip home. And, and Glenda said something about, boy, I'd like to have a, wish our house was just all on one floor, because you know, she, she's, she's getting old and decrepit and she can't barely get up down the steps. <laughs> okay, all right. And, uh, uh, and Seth said, well, there's a, there's a one level house for sale out here near where we live. So she wanted, to, she wanted to drive by it. Just looking at the landscaping wore me out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she said something about, uh, you know, we were talking about it. And, and uh, uh, I said, well, you know, I, uh, I plan on working another 10 or 15 years. She said, aren't you going to retire? No, I don't want to retire. I don't work now. Okay. Uh, I, I, I go to what people call work, and I work four long days a week. But I work. I use the God-given gifts that he's given me to encourage and to pastor and to teach people. What I do four days a week is not a job, it's, it's a ministry. And as long as I can use that gift, I intend to use that gift. I, I don't, my, my objective is not to take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. No, I enjoy life, I have a good time with life. The three days that, that, that I don't go to that, uh, you know, we do a lot of great things. But the point I'm making is this. Generosity is not about storing up. It's not about storing up. It's about giving. So he said, well, I'll just tear them down and build some other ones. Then I'll take life easy. Uh, I've, I've laid up enough stuff to take care of me for many years. I'll take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. Now that's not a... That's not a uh, Compliment. No, it's not a compliment at all. Uh, Jesus says to us, don't call any man a fool. I, I mean, that's a huge indictment. But Jesus felt, and he, he gets to, he, he said, you're a fool, man. Now, most people around this little place where he was would have looked at him and said, wow, what a successful guy. He, he's got it made. And Jesus said, you don't have it made. You're a fool. Here, here's a side lesson. No, that's right. It's a direct lesson. Be careful what you listen to mm -hmm. and what standards you follow. Because what society says, wow, Jesus might say, you're a fool. Make sure that he's the one who says, wow, about your life. God said to him, you're a fool. This very night, oh, I've laid stuff up for years. Hmm. Your kinfolk are going to fight over it. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for you? this is how it will be with anyone here it is get this okay the yellow lights flickered so we're almost done hang in there with me this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself okay who are you storing up for but is not rich toward Get that. That, that. that ought to be a verse that you memorize. 
that ought to be a verse that's in, 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 in embedded in your head. It's not about things. And, and, and trust me, don't hear me say that I think if you have things that you're wrong. God wants you to have things. He wants to bless you with things. But he wants you to keep those things in the proper perspective. Abraham was probably one of the wealthiest men on the face of the earth at his time. Because God blessed him. But Abraham kept perspective on the things in life. And it wasn't storing them up to store them. He said, be rich toward God. Rich toward God. Simple question. Okay. How rich were you toward God this week? Well, Mike, I'm not sure I know what that means. Well, it means, well, tell me what you think it means. Being rich toward God. We ought to figure that out. Because that's very important. How much did you give of yourself to others? Yeah. 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 Boy, I wish we had another 15 minutes. Well, he left, so he, he, he doesn't know what time we stop. So. <laughs> Say it again, Pete. How much did you give of yourself to others? Yeah. So, very simple question. As you look at this last week, Wednesday night, Brian was leading our Bible study, and we talked about Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where it says, in view of God's mercy, present your bodies as living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. What's a sacrifice? It's doing something that costs you something. Okay? Now, again, think this one through. And, and don't, don't do like most weeks. Think it through for about 30 seconds and then forget about it. If you were to go home this afternoon and write down everything you did this past week that was a sacrifice to you to care for and bless somebody else, how much would be on what would be on your list? That's what being rich toward God is. That's what building up treasures in heaven is about. And, and that's, that's where I want to be. Uh, that's where I want my affluence to take place. I, 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 want, to have, I want to have a much nicer, more splendid place in heaven than Marty has. I don't know if that's how it works. You know, I don't know if there's going to be the, uh, uh, the, the great big mansions, and, uh, the shacks over in Shantytown. I'd be happy to have a shack over in Shantytown. Me heaven. too. Yeah. But build up treasures in heaven. We're so, and this is what generosity is about. We are so eager and so controlled to build up treasures here. And it's okay to have treasures here if you keep them in the right perspective. This rich young ruler, this ruler, this wealthy man, he, he had it all wrong. He had it all wrong. His total focus was, how can I fill up more buildings at Rhino to take care of me the rest of my life? And he wasn't being rich toward God at all. And Jesus said this, if you're not rich toward God, if you're not generous, and I know we're still talking about money, okay? But remember, that's the bottom of the bar about being rich toward God. If you're not rich toward God, if you're not generous in some of the areas we're going to talk about on down the road, plus this one, you're a fool. Jesus said, can't come from a better source. If you want to be blessed and you want to be happy, and, and the people afflicted with affluenza are seeking, they're, they're getting, whatever they're doing is getting them everything they don't want. Because they've not learned that very simple phrase that there's more blessing, there's more peace, there's more uh, 
joy. satisfaction and joy uh, in giving than it is in, in receiving. Marty? I always tell the story about when Abby was young, she first started running the track, she ran the hurdles. I'll never forget, she was running a race, hit the hurdle and fell flat on her face. I mean, just, I mean, cut herself all up. I tell people who have become new Christians, I said the first hurdle you gotta get over when you're living your Christian life is to learn to give to God the way you should. And mm -hmm. most people stumble and fall right flat on their face and don't yeah. get very far. I mean, that's, that's so important. It's such a, a basic truth about Christianity that people need to live and learn and learn what you're talking about, of, of generosity and, and knowing that. And we will be the light of the world and the salt of the world if we do that. Mm -hmm. It will make a big difference. Yeah. 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 One thing I think that's very important when we talk about sacrifice is don't wait until your kids are older. While they're young, teach them that. Amen. Alexa and I were talking yesterday, and I asked her <coughs> what she thought sacrifice was, and she told me. And then I told her, I said, um, you know how much you love Starbucks, this pink drink? And she said, oh, I love that. She said, I would just, I just couldn't give that up. And I said, well, do you know that the CEO of that company said, he didn't want Christians or conservatives or police officers coming into their businesses. She said, really? And I said, yeah. And I said, a sacrifice would be for you to stop drinking that pink drink. And she looked at me and then she said, well, then I'll stop drinking it. She said, because I need a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And I thought, if they can learn it that young, <laughs> it will help her when she's an adult. Yeah, if they, if they don't learn it that young, if they see their parents chasing after things to bring satisfaction and, and uh, contentment in life, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to chase after things, even harder than their parents chased after things. 